Hello and welcome to a fast interview from New Zealand. Uh, during my trip here I'm speaking with a number of uh, candidates and activists so we can learn about the politics of New Zealand, uh, what are the main issues and also what Australia can learn from uh, New Zealand politics. So I'm lucky to be joined uh, today by the uh, Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party of New Zealand, Elliot Hickley. Welcome well, to Tim. Very good to be here. So um, you're considered probably the most um, pure uh, Conservative Party in, in New Zealand. Uh, at the label Conservative, it's applied to many different people who have differing views on a lot of issues. So I thought I'd start by asking, what does being Conservative mean to you? For myself, especially as I grow up and how I have found life to be, conservative is specifically for me is the social conservative side of things. So when we talk about social conservative, we think about the ideas of looking at traditional aspects of society and protecting those that have positive and good outcomes. As the big example, of course, is natural marriage. I've worked in the field for many, many years of suicidal ideation in our youth the rage and the pain that they experience and that they give out to the society around them. And the one biggest factor in that is natural family. Mum, dad, biological, married, low to moderate conflict, marriage. And that actually has a, a wealth of health benefits, economic benefits, and that comes obscurely under the idea of social conservatism, where we know that some people wish to re redefine marriage and we know that that is not the ideal location for a child to be brought up. So as an example of the social conservative that I follow, um, that is the idea of protecting a traditional aspect of society that has good and positive outcomes. In terms of our fiscal conservatism, I am a little bit more closer to the centre before moving to the left. So as a Pacifica, as a person who is coming whose bloodline comes from the islands. We grew up in different families, and I'm aware of, of deep poverty. And so there is actually a need for social welfare in our society. I think, I think there is definitely some discussion that needs to be held, and a tension balance needs to be followed in terms of personal responsibility and the state actually assisting those people. Now, that's an argument that needs to be had, and there are pros and cons for both of that. But overall, in terms of myself, my line on the spectrum, I'm definitely a social conservative first and foremost. Uh, I noticed that um, the, the Conservative Party of uh, New Zealand on, because uh, economics is probably where most um, conservatives uh, differ, uh, definitely uh, you yourself and the Conservative Party in general feel that a more centrist economic position it fits in with conservatism. Yes, yes, most definitely. And I think neoliberalism is a good place to argue that point. I know that there are some very strong areas of thought. We know that our left, far left, or mid to the far left party Labour brought in neoliberalism and that basically took the dereg that deregulated business and they allowed them to set up. Now as an economic system it wasn't so much that neoliberalism was bad, it was that it set up the people groups who had economic systems in their culture for thousands of years or millennia and then you set that up with groups who had economic systems for maybe 100, 150 years maximum. So when you had neoliberalism, that stuck everyone together and said, right, go for it. And the problem, of course, was that those groups who had, had millennia of experience with it were able to basically lord that a little bit over those people groups who had it in less than two centuries of experience with it. That meant that neoliberalism itself is not the best system, even though I know that it gets argued a bit in conservative and fiscal conservative circles. I think we need to have a tension balance of at least protecting certain people groups from the practices that are within that deregulated market. The reason why I ask the, the question is because we have a new Conservative Party uh, in Australia, I'm not sure if you're aware, they're in terms of economics very almost uh, libertarian. So. It's interesting how your, your party is quite different, but for you, uh, it all comes back down to family policy. You believe that a good society, like it all starts with, with strong families and, yep. and these, these other sort of societal problems can be, uh, well, not so much uh, uh, fixed overnight, but good family, that 
leads to less social problems. Absolutely, it, it is the centre of everything. The quality of the quality of every single generation that occurs in any society is based on the quality of the family within which that that young person grew up in. If we have a mum and a dad who are biological together, what we know is that mum provides us a beautifully nurturing, protective, growing environment. And then we know that dad comes in at that teenage stage and actually builds the resilience, builds the empowerment, and builds the ability to have depth of strength in order to make it forward in life. We can trace that all the way to economic success. We can trace that to the, the suicidal ideation being so much lower in that group of people. We can track that in terms of the decision-making processes throughout the entire life. And even the multitudinal study over the 70-year study, and even the Poulton study actually shows us that there is a great wealth of ability to live well and decently from those who come from a mum-dad home. And I know that from the other side because my mum was a teen mum and I grew up with a solo dad. I know that very well. Now obviously in New Zealand elections for a party to gain uh, seats in parliament you need to obtain 5% of the party vote or uh, win an electorate. Now there's a lot of uh, minor parties who are trying to get to that 5%. So why do you believe the Conservative Party can can get to 5%? Well, there's two angles here. One, I want Money Doer. Money Doer is the electorate that we are in right now, and Money Doer is the electorate that I'm fighting for, and I've fought for, for years unofficially in the political area. The idea of 5% is really difficult, but we need to at least be that voice because we are the only pro-life voice, and we're the only voice that speaks up for quite a lot of the, the so-called silent majority uh, and when we talk about family we get a lot of great attention from it when we talk about youth and the structures and the challenges of family that also becomes that resonates greatly with people now if we are not speaking as an example euthanasia will come in unchallenged now for us we protect life from the womb to the tomb is what we say we don't like abortion and we also do not like the idea of state-sponsored suicide, increasing suicide. And so it doesn't make sense how I would be trying to talk down a youth from committing suicide, and yet I'm saying it's okay, for, if you're sick and old, then you can kill yourself. And while we are not in Parliament, we do not have a proper voice for families to be able to say, protect families, protect a life from womb to tomb, protect anything. As we sit here, people are killing themselves, people are dying on the streets, people are being attacked, by young people who are themselves being hugely harmed by other policies being made to hurt their families. So we need to be here as a matter of integrity to our value system. Whether we get it or not is beside the point. We must be there because the values that we hold are the very values that societies worldwide are built on. So whether we get there or not, doesn't matter. It's integrity. Uh, not only that, actually, we believe in money and that we do have a good chance. And obviously the reason why you've started this political parties is because, uh, is because you believe that the major parties uh, are letting the, the people of New, New Zealand down. You've mentioned obviously the life issues are, are quite prominent this campaign. What are some of the other issues that you feel are, are being ignored by, well not just by the major parties, but also by the media as well, which plays a big role in elections? Right, so one of the big, big issues that we have is we do have a bit of a weakening in democracy, or I guess and as an example, we've had five citizens-initiated referendum, and, and a citizens-initiated referendum is one where, where hundreds of thousands of people have gotten together and they've signed a bit of paper and they've said, right, we want the, the political parties, we want the leaders to actually listen to what we're saying and change a law. Now, that's happened in New Zealand five times. That means that hundreds of thousands of people have put their names on the vote. That's gone to Parliament. Parliament has been forced to make what we call a referendum. We've all voted in those referendums, and every single time, the government has ignored, absolutely ignored us. Uh, as an example, anti-smacking bill was brought out, our child abuse rates actually increased, we had more harm, and now parents are scared to actually discipline their children at a high level consequence level. A referendum was held, over 80% of the people who voted, voted to no, repeal that law. It's a bad, bad law, and it's hurting good parents. The government of the day said, no, no, absolutely not. We, we can't be bothered with it. We are not going to deal with it. They did not. Five times and five times it was ignored. 
the Conservative Party one of our, our founding document is based on a citizens initiated referendum being binding, which means that if it is a referendum, if it does get through, no government can change it, it must be done by the will of the people. And there's enough people that it's needed that it wouldn't have in stupid laws like having weed become legal or anything like that. Uh, I think it's uh, it's obviously great that you had this citizen and you share a referenda uh, process in, in Australia with, you're probably aware we're having a plebiscite on yeah. same-sex marriage, it's our first national vote in. We're watching very carefully. Please, vote no, honestly, vote no, it's safer for you. It's, yeah, it's our first national vote in 18 years and it's uh, the, the government of the day, they've had to like fight tooth and nail to, to, to get it help. So and New Zealand's ahead of the curve when it comes to giving the, the public a, a greater say. But yes, I, I've, when I saw the results, of especially the smacking one, it was 87% mm. opposed it and government ignored it. That's, that should be outrageous. I yeah. mean, so it's so definitely, oh, I think you're, you're halfway there when it comes to you know, giving the people a say your party wants to you know, get the other half there. Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. At, at the moment it's vacuous. So you, you've got this idea where, where the parliament say, oh, we will listen to you, but we also reserve the right to ignore you. And that, that doesn't work. And we also know that in New Zealand we have what's called conscience votes, which means that theoretically an MP is able to vote the way their conscience feels or their constituents feel. But what we have seen is the opposite. We've seen a conscience vote simply be used as lip service, as words, and then we've seen that they must vote along party lines. And we've actually seen that some MPs have paid for the price of actually going with their actual conscience. And that's a very sad thing. Yeah, I don't like conscience votes personally. It seems to be like you don't elect MPs to vote how they feel when they got out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's not, a, it's not doesn't even seem democratic, but what it does seem to be is a bit of lip service and an attempt to obscure and obfuscate the real issues of the day, really. Uh, and obviously, uh, direct democracy, it has its uh, critics. Some say you know, it undermines the, the fact that uh, New Zealand is meant to be a representative democracy and there's also the concern about the tyranny of the majority. How do you, how do you handle those criticisms? Oh, well, one of the great things is that the whole idea about mob rule and, and being scared you need to have, you need to have over a hundred thousand votes to even start to kick off a referendum, and the idea of being able to get someone to, to put a signature to a vote, uh, sorry, put the signature on a petition first and foremost is not that easy. You've got to work at it. You've got to gather enough attention. You've got to pull that in. Even if you manage to get it to a referendum level, which is not that easy, even after that there is a whole bunch of discussions to be held around what are the pros, what are the cons, and, and even in your plebiscite right now, you are having those discussions. It's, it's messy, and there are media biases that are actually starting to show up, so that's actually a bit of a negative, or actually that's a good thing, because it's exposing some of the unethical practices by some of your news outlets. So that's actually a, a positive. We are seeing some of the negative things coming out, and we can actually confront those. The idea of someone bringing in, oh, we can all ride on elephants, for example, Let's say we can all ride on elephants to school and back again. That rule would never be passed or would never get to a referendum because it is a, it is a foolish one that your average intelligent person would never put their pen to paper on. So even your political parties, they do not get 5%, for example. So the idea of a foolish rule coming in is basically insulting the intelligence of your average citizen by saying, well, you don't have enough thought processes to actually think and consider what you're actually putting your name to paper to, to kick off a referendum and then to vote for or against something. I definitely think that's a, that's a good answer because uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, there, there seems to be a lot of checks and balances during the, the referenda process, but uh, the, the important thing is that at the end of the process it's the people that get to decide, not yep. the politicians. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep, that's totally right. And, and a person is such a, an intelligent person. We, we are intelligent people, we don't do stupid things all the time, and when it comes to a considered question, we, we think about things, it's just natural. And, of course, I must ask the question, obviously, you, you, uh, you and the Conservative Party have your, your own set of values, would you accept the, the result of the people if, if they rejected your preferred policy? Yes, because that's democracy. 
I want everyone to vote no when it comes to euthanasia, state sponsored suicide. I desperately want people to vote no. But if there was a referendum, and if they all, if, well, if the majority voted for the idea of, of euthanasia, then we would abide by it. Wouldn't like it, but we would definitely abide by it because that's democracy. Yep, that's that's definitely the the important thing at the the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, another um, general term that's thrown thrown around uh, a bit is the the term freedom. The the left they they interpret freedom in a certain way. Uh, libertarians interpret freedom in a particular way. Uh, what uh, what does freedom mean to you? Oh gosh, this is a beautiful question, really hard question. Both my grandfathers fought in World War Two. I honour them every single day that I can and I'm proud to wear the medals every single time April 25th comes around. And I believe in the tenants and I believe in what they sacrificed their living lives for. Freedom means that our system should give opportunity and should be made in such a way that it allows people to make choices in life that take them up and down equally. Because everyone Everyone has an idea of personal responsibility. Everyone should have the idea of reward from effort that they put in. And everyone should be at least looked after to the very point where they can actually take on more things to help them succeed. So I, one thing about freedom that I like is the ability to choose for oneself. But what I really want to make sure is that we are protecting the freedoms for the, for the people themselves. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's go for a very contentious area. Transgenderism. Let's go for transgenderism. Uh, transgenderism, the people who suffer from gender dysphoria, we need, we need to be treating them with love and compassion. We must treat them with love and compassion. At the same time, we are hurting them if we, if we force society to accept the delusion that a boy is a girl and a girl is a boy because that harms them by actually not dealing with the core issue. And it also harms the free will choice of other people in order to, to keep their areas. So if you are a girl, we should protect the environments that are for a girl. So your, your girls changing toilets, sports teams, we should protect those. We should actually have a discrimination aspect. Discrimination is not always bad, it's good. And so we, just, and so we protect their freedom within that. And the idea of freedom means to protect opportunity and protect, and protect society from the incursion of ideologies that actually seek to impact negatively on the freedoms of others, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's always a, a difficult act, balancing the, the freedoms of um, you know, one, one group with the, with the, the freedoms, freedoms of another. And, um, uh, that's that's probably where m most of us differ. One one set of people, you know, these pe these people's freedoms are, are more are more important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, the group says uh, the, these freedoms are important, but it's, def it's definitely something which I think people need to investigate for themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I think what, what worries me a bit is that we are actually starting to see freedom of speech starting to be curtailed a little bit. I'm online a bit, and I have dared people to find, uh, I've given people $1,000 if they can find any evidence of my commentary to actually be uh, homophobic and transphobic and all that sort of stuff, you know. But whenever I speak, usually there's a great deal of vitriol in my direction, saying, oh, I'm, I'm this and that. Not only that, we've also had a pro-life Auckland group in the university has been shut down, not shut down, but disaffiliated. And that's been disaffiliated, and one of the question, parts of that were around the ideology that they have, and they also want to disaffiliate other groups of similar ideology. That was a quote. They also went, the also had uh, Family First, the charity, deregistered for reasons of them speaking up about family. So the idea of freedom of speech is actually not that free, and it cost us the sacrifice of men like my grandfathers. Uh, and we need to be able to have these places where freedom is there for us to be able to agree and disagree and to discuss. But what we're seeing more and more is the removal of elements of free speech that will eventually lead to that most left wing of ideologies, <coughs> fascism.
which is a very fearful thing. We do not want to get into that point. We're not there yet. We're not even close to there yet. But we are definitely along that now path. We are along that path heading that way now. And we don't want that. We must pull back. We must be conservative. We must actually get back to saying that freedom is for everyone. Uh, sadly, Australia and New Zealand are alike in, in that trend and regard, but uh, thank you for, for speaking to the Unshackled Elliot. Good awesome. luck for the, the campaign. It's certainly, um, I'm fascinated by it. I don't know what the result's going to be, but I'm certainly a enjoying covering it. So awesome. all the best. Oh, thank you so much. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.